welcome to this Rosetta workshop on computer-aided design of antibodies and vaccines. It's my great pleasure to give an introductory lecture that highlights uh, some of the accomplishments that Rosetta has in this area. This will by no means be complete. It will also be somewhat um, biased towards our own work. Um, my name is Jens Meiler. I'm professor at Vanderbilt University and also at Leipzig University. And um, I'm working with the Rosetta um, software and developing Rosetta for uh, more, than, more than 20 years. So again, this will sort of be an introductory lecture. Um, and I hope I will keep that within 45 minutes. Um, my laboratory, as I just said, is working with Rosetta for many, many years. Um, we are mostly interested in protein structure prediction from limited data, a lot of membrane protein structure prediction. We develop um, Rosetta ligand and Rosetta drug discovery tools uh, that sort of mesh uh, docking and design simulations with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we also have a deep interest in engineering proteins. And this is where we're going to spend today um, uh, how we design antibodies or possibly um, uh, immunogens and vaccine candidates with this particular software. Now, we have to keep in mind some of the fundamentals of protein folding. Uh, so the actual protein folding problem and the inverse protein folding problem. So I have a few slides that you know, are probably not telling you anything new here, but just to, just to make sure we are all starting from the same page. Um, here we do see, um, uh, um, you know, how two amino acids undergo a chemical reaction to form the peptide bond. And this chemical reaction is repeated in the ribosome um, dozens of times to create this primary structure, this chain of amino acids. And you all know that um, for function, these proteins need to fold. So they undergo a process where they adopt um, tertiary structure um, and sometimes even a quaternary structure that places atoms at specific positions in space. That's the central dogma of structural biology that this shape of the protein, this overall shape is critical for um, function. So the sequence, the amino acid sequence defines mostly unambiguously a structure and that structure defines the function. And this makes structure zone central key when uh, talking about protein function. Um, often when we talk about this protein folding problem, um, so folding, pro folding problem um, is basically stated by, you know, given the one dimensional sequence, predict the tertiary structure. We go via this intermediate state of uh, predicting secondary structure, alpha helices and uh, beta sheets, for example. Um, as, as, a, as a midpoint here. So the uh, inverse protein folding problem um, sort of turns this uh, process around. In the protein folding world, we ask, here's the sequence, what's the structure, what's the function? In the, um, in the protein uh, design world, and, uh, which is affiliated with the inverse protein folding problem, we want to go the other way around. We are interested in a function. What tertiary structure is needed to, to do this function? And then what sequence falls into that structure and positions all the functional residues in the right uh, point, in, point in space? Um, again, the, the, the idea being that nature only uses a small portion of the protein space, sequence, and structural space, the small portion that it um, you know, sampled in evolution. And by engineering uh, additional uh, proteins, we can conduct new and exciting functions um, that we might not see in nature or not have in that you know, quality in nature. Um, I don't need to remind you, but we classify the amino acids in hydrophobics and hydrophilics, um, uh, the 20 sort of uh, genetically encoded amino acids. And I don't tell you anything new that one, one important part portion of uh, protein folding is what we call the hydrophobic co collapse. The um, drive to take these hydrophobic amino acids and wet 
and bury them in the center of the structure, exposing the hydrophilics. Um, and this is an um, uh, uh, entropic, uh, entropic effect for the most part, uh, compacting the protein and exposing hydrophilics makes it easier for the water uh, solution around the protein to move. And so you have an entropic, entropic gain there. There are also some entropic effects. Um, and then um, uh, this initial entropic, um, you know, hydrophobic collapse is followed by very specific um, entalpic interactions made within the protein to stabilize the native state, the structure that ultimately gonna be uh, biologically active. And so um, uh, this structure is driven by very specific interactions such as hydrogen bonds, Van der Waals interactions, disulfide bridges, ionic bonds, and they need to adopt a very precise geometry to minimize the overall energy. And this is what drives uh, protein folding. Now I tell you this because, you know, during this week's, during the other lecture, some of these fundamentals play an important role and you will learn details on how we simulate these uh, processes and interactions within the Rosetta software. I will not have time today to, to go into much detail about that, but um, I wanted to sort of uh, spend this little bit of time to just set the tone and, and, and uh, set the expectations. So um, I mentioned earlier, structure drives function. Um, so here we have sort of the unfolded protein, the primary structure. We have a small number of functional groups, side chains, maybe some backbone atoms. Only after protein folding, these functional groups are positioned in three-dimensional space so that the protein can conduct its function, in this case, bind the cofactor, for example. And so this is very important to understand, again, three-dimensional structure links sequence to function. And this <clears throat> makes the protein folding problem very important to understand what proteins do. We know their sequence, we wanna know their structure in order to understand their function. And it makes the inverse protein folding problem so central in engineering proteins with new function. We have a desired function. We can think about how the structure should look like and then engineer a sequence. And so um, Rosetta is a software package that um, uh, does this. Um, not only these applications, it also has a whole lot of other uh, applications. I talked, about, for example, about the truck discovery portions that we develop. Um, it can work with DNA and RNA interactions, uh, membrane proteins, peptides, many other tasks uh, uh, can be modeled in this sort of comprehensive suite, which is freely available for non-commercial use. Um, however, the protein folding problem and the inverse protein folding problem were sort of the starting points of the development of Rosetta. And so it's only fair that we focus on this. Rosetta is developed as an academic package. It's developed uh, worldwide by um, uh, more than 50 laboratories. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a very active community where students and postdocs work together, uh, constantly uh, coming up with new and innovative algorithms. Um, um, as I said, um, distributed over many different places in, <clears throat> in the world. So without that, I will be able to go into uh, great detail on how these algorithms function. I uh, gonna show you um, uh, short uh, movies that sort of explain uh, some of the uh, big ideas behind Rosetta. So the protein folding problem, as I mentioned, given the amino acid sequence, what's the three-dimensional fold? And if you think about this, this is, you know, for a computer scientist, for a bioinformatician, maybe an interesting problem because it is not easy to solve. Um, it's also something nature goes through every day, um, you know, millions of times in your body, proteins are expressed and they need to fold and they should fold into the correct structure to do their function. And if they misfold often, can create uh, uh, difficulties or diseases. And why is it a difficult problem? Well, um, <clears throat> you know, and, um, and protein might consist out of 100 amino acids. That would be a small protein. Um, 
And each of those amino acids is a small molecule, right? An organic molecule maybe has a hundred conformations. So if you exhaustively want to combine that, you suddenly have a hundred to the power of 100 or 10 to the power of 200 possible conformations. Um, and this is too much to so search exhaustively, right? If you need a second to sample one conformation or even you know, 10 to the 10 conformations or something like that. If you really wanted to build all of these conformations that would need longer than Earth exists. So nature can't fold proteins by sampling all conformations. And this is a long-standing formulation known as Leventhal's paradox um, that um, nature is not sampling all possible conformations for a protein to find the active native conformation. Um, this is um, not surprising to us today because um, we know that a minimization of free energy drives protein folding. And so <clears throat> starting from some conformation, we are following a pathway that reduces the free energy. And that's why we don't need to sample all conformations of high energy, we just go down this energy funnel. Um, but uh, it's still important to understand um, uh, because it creates two challenges for us. The first challenge is the sampling challenge. We need to sample likely conformations, conformations that might have a low energy. And for the computer, in the computer, this creates a second problem, the so-called scoring problem. We need to compute or estimate the free energy of a conformation of a protein. Nature has the advantage that it can, you know, read out the free energy accurately in zero time um, at any point, at any given point. But um, in the computer, we don't have this advantage. And um, we need to um, uh, very much work with simplified energy functions to rapidly estimate the free energy. And you will learn something about how this is done specifically in Rosetta and how we achieve the speed that is, that is needed. Um, but um, I show you here um, one of those folding trajectories. So this is starting from an elongated amino acid chain. Let me see if I manage to even turn on my laser pointer here. Uh, starting from an elongated chain and you see how it folds. The rainbow colored amino acid chain, that's the simulation. In gray, you see from some time to time uh, a gray structure, that's the that's ubiquitin, that's the crystal structure, the experimental structure of this protein uh, called ubiquitin. And uh, that is for comparison. So this is a benchmark. You will hear this week a lot about benchmarks that we use to test all these algorithms working. So running a simulation where we know the actual answer. And so this is um, uh, the simulation that we are uh, following in this particular um, case. Now, let me um, go back to the beginning of the simulation and see if I can, if I can restart it. Um, so this simulation shows nicely our approach to sampling, which is a Monte Carlo algorithm. We apply very large structural changes. We estimate the free energy before and after. And if the free energy is reduced, we accept the conformational change. So this is this, we follow this downward trajectory into this folding funnel, trying to minimize the energy. And the fact this Monte Carlo simulation, the fact that it does so large conformational changes is where a lot of the speed comes from. This simulation takes about a minute on your, on your PC. Um, it's a stochastic process. So um, uh, we have no guarantee it finds the lowest energy structure and our energy function is much simplified. So we have no guarantee that the lowest energy structure is the native like. So we have to run this several thousand times to sample the conformational space, find all possible low energy conformations and then we can work with those. Um, the other thing is these simulations can get stuck in local energy minima, misfolded. And so um, uh, there is a chance that once in a while we accept a conformational change that increases the energy slightly. And that's called a so-called metropolis criterion. And you will hear about that uh, this week. Um, you probably have heard a lot about um, alpha fold. Rosetta, this folding simulation, you know, in Rosetta, these algorithms were originally conceived uh, around the year 2000. So they um, um, are uh, 20 years old. And at that time, that was a breakthrough similar to what is alpha fold doing today. 
I just wanted to point out, um, you know, recently using machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence in protein folding has led to several breakthroughs. AlphaFold 2.0 is the best well known one, but also in Rosetta, we are actively working on um, uh, adding these artificial intelligence approaches to um, our uh, folding simulations. And here's just one example for this uh, feature. So um, this is the advantage since this package is constantly developed by so many uh, research groups that uh, we very quickly can pick up um, any uh, sort of new developments in this area. And to be honest, uh, Rosetta has used um, uh, uh, you know, neural networks uh, from almost from day one, uh, uh, for example, to predict secondary structure. Um, so it's nothing new that we use machine learning in the connection with protein folding, but certainly in the last years, there have been some uh, tremendous progress is made. Uh, for the inverse protein folding problem, we start with the protein structure, but we don't know the sequence. So we ask which, which sequence stabilizes that structure. And similarly, you can imagine you need to sample in each position of the amino of the of the of the, of the sequence all possible amino acids and all possible conformations maybe absent from some region that you want to have a certain amino acid and a certain conformation for function right uh, this is again a very large search space so you have again a sampling problem and you need to find a low energy sequence and conformation and again that's not easy we again use a monte carlo algorithm now you see the structure is fixed. I only show you know, the backbone here, alpha helices, two, five strands. I only show the residues in the core, the amino acids in the core of the protein to not make it too confusing. But you do see identities and conformations are sim simultaneously sampled and sort of give you a very nice idea of which of those uh, are um, stable and low energy. Um, here I plot some of these Monte Carlo rejected steps that are high in energy with very hydrophilic amino acids in the core. But then once we switch back to accepted steps, we very quickly see very apolar amino acids in the core of the protein in the conformation and sequence similar to um, uh, uh, the native one. And uh, this is uh, a little bit uh, um, uh, cheating here because this protein was actually designed on the computer. And again, the study is, uh, you know, almost, uh, um, uh, um, uh, almost 20 years old where uh, this fold, which at that point has not been observed in nature, was um, uh, taken um, and um, uh, an amino acid sequence was designed to sort of optimally fold into that structure. And then the experimental structure was determined after the fact. And here we see a superimposition of the experimental structure and um, the uh, protein sequence. Um, and we do um, nicely see that um, the, uh, um, uh, there is a very good agreement uh, to you know, the precise conformation of the side chains. Um, between the experiment and the design. And this is sort of a given for this, um, for this algorithm to function um, or, or, or you know, for this design to, to function, you need to get it correct at atomic detail. And so um, the design model, by the way, is in blue, the uh, X-ray structure, the experimental structure is in red. Okay, and so um, I think these are sort of giving us a little bit of a background in the area of uh, where Rosetta is coming from, protein folding and the inverse protein folding problem. And um, now I um, um, will um, go ahead and um, uh, uh, switch gears a little bit and we go more specifically in the realm of antibodies and vaccines, which we're gonna mostly focus on during uh, this week's um, course. So um, now we could spend a long time talking about our immune system. It's incredibly complex, incredibly advanced, and I don't have the time to do that. So we're really just gonna focus on the, some of features that are important to us. And I um, uh, encourage you, um, go at go ahead and read, you know, a, a textbook if you want to 
learn more. But what's exciting about our immune system is that um, this idea from sequence to structure to function is lived by the immune system. Um, our immune system needs to recognize pathogens, viruses, and other um, uh, uh, you know, pathogens that uh, get into our body. And they do that with proteins, with antibodies. Um, and specifically here we see an antibody, they use the, the tip of those antibodies here and here. Um, these are surfaces that the human body, our immune system can design, if you like. It can optimize these surfaces to bind tightly to a particular target protein that could be on the surface of a virus. And this is done in two steps, very much simplified. First of all, there is a large background distribution of antibodies with different sequences at this tip. And this happens by having uh, these antibodies, the sequences for these proteins assembled from uh, different genes. Um, um, uh, there are genes for the, for the heavy chain and also for the light chain. And while these genes are assembled to form these antibodies, combining different you know, uh, 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 genes already gives you some sequence variability. And then there is also um, an, an, an process that can add nucleotides into that sequence and thus again change the amino acid. And this is where this large variability um, comes from. However, um, the, the hope is that whenever you know, you're infected with say a virus, that there are a few of these antibodies, a few of those 10 to the 11 that will bind um, with some low affinity to the surface proteins of these, uh, of these uh, viruses, let's say. However, um, they will not bind tightly enough to really neutralize, to really prevent this virus to, say, get into the human cells. That's why, you know, even if you have an infection, it takes some time, it takes a week or so until, you know, uh, you have uh, antibodies developed that bind tightly. And this is a, a, a done in a, in a, in a uh, process that is called maturation, where the tightest binding antibodies can be selected and modified in their sequence to further optimize the binding. And again, the body has a mechanism to look for tighter and tighter binding. So it's sort of a small evolutionary process that happens um, at, at, that, at that time. And you know, a vaccination would just sort of uh, simulate this process of an infection with uh, maybe the surface protein of the virus, which in and itself is not dangerous, but you will develop antibodies that bind tightly. So if the real virus comes along, you have immediately neutralizing antibodies without waiting for a week. And that's why you don't have the infection and possibly the disease. So, um, uh, so in a nutshell, again, this is sort of uh, what's happening. And since this process is so important for the human body, we want to understand it with computation. And then secondly, um, we want to engineer antibodies. And ultimately, we want to thirdly engineer uh, vaccines, engineer uh, proteins that can be used to elicit antibodies that protect us from any diseases. And so uh, here's again such a schema of an antibody um, where we have um, you know, the two heavy chains. Uh, they have precisely the same sequence. They have three um, complementary determining regions. These are the regions where the sequence is varied most um, and that recognize the so-called antigen, which could again be a viral surface protein. And then there is a light chain, which is con considerably shorter. That's why it's called light chain. And it has also three of these complementary determining region. Um, should also mention at this point that H3, heavy chain complementary determining region, three is by far the one with the most sequence vari variability and it's often a critical one. And we're gonna see that in some of those interactions. And so in this very uh, uh, cartoony kind of uh, uh, view, you can sort of um, see how these uh, complementary determining regions then sort of bind collectively our antigen. So, um, as I said, there's a complex process that um, is used to um, 
uh, go through this affinity maturation where we go from a low affinity antibody to a high affinity antibody. There's also a way to store these high affinity antibodies away into memory of the immune system via these memory B cells so that if you get infected 10 years later, you are still protected. And again, a lot of our vaccines um, uh, use this knowledge. I will um, not uh, go any further into that, um, into an, into that um, uh, mechanism, um, again, um, because of time. And also uh, we want to re really focus on the actual design. So um, let's look at a specific antibody, right? This looked kind of um, very interesting. Now we are looking just at this very tip of the antibody, the complementary determinant regions and the antigen here on the left-hand side, but on a structure. And let me walk you through this. Uh, in Salmon on the top, this is um, a viral protein. In fact, um, this is a mimic of the surface protein of the HI virus. And um, what these viruses do is they, let me see if I can restart this movie here. Um, Maybe not. Let's do that. Okay, so yeah, now it's funny. Um, so they, they decorate their surface with glycans, with sugar molecules we see here in green. And um, these are there to sort of um, distract the human immune system. Our antibodies ideally would bind very specifically to the protein part, but if you put enough glycans on the surface, you can cover what we call good epitopes, epitopes that these antibodies, these surfaces that the antibodies want to bind to or should bind to, and then it's difficult for our immune system to develop good antibodies. Down here we have an antibody called PG9, uh, green is the light chain, um, blue is the heavy chain, the uh, complementary determining regions are labeled HCD1, 3, 2, 3. And here already you see how important HCD3 is for this antibody. It's a very long loop. It winds into this structure between the glycans and it binds to this particular region of the surface protein, which is really needed uh, for, the, for the activity for cell and try um, of this, of this, of HIV. And then it comes back down. This is actually a partly neutralizing antibodies against HIV. So it's a common uh, misconception that the human immune system cannot create partly neutralizing antibodies against HIV that would protect us from AIDS. Um, uh, it can. There are all such antibodies and they can be produced by the human immune system. The problem are these glycans and other things on the surface of HIV. And the chance that these initial low affinity antibodies bind to the glycans and other unimportant regions is very high. Our immune system gets excited and optimizes the sequence of those antibodies to bind more tightly. And the virus rearranges the genome, rearranges the positions of the glycans, adds some mutations to the surface. And uh, these antibodies will be useless. But there are epitopes on the surface of HIV on um, uh, um, uh, the surface protein that can be targeted by partly neutralizing antibodies. Unfortunately, these are made um, only by a fraction of the patient and usually too late in the, in the progress of the, of the disease um, and uh, to, to really protect. And so one of the objectives is to engineer vaccines, immunogens, that are gonna create such partly neutralizing good antibodies early in the game. And the first step is to understand how these antibodies really look like uh, so that we know what are the best antibodies a human can make. And then we can go from there and ask, um, you know, how do we elicit these type of antibodies? And I will um, uh, go ahead and just grab something to drink here. Um, so that I don't lose my voice in the middle of this talk. So, um, 
let's uh, go on and uh, look at a few ideas um, that uh, we can um, uh, sort of start to start thinking about in the context of um, <clears throat> engineering antibodies before we get to the topic of engineering immunogens. So <clears throat> this is a study we published a few years back. Um, what we did here is we took three co-custal structures of antibodies these are the PDB codes. Um, and um, we um, used uh, these three antibodies that you know, were in complex with their target. We see that here, one, two, three antibodies. They were in complex with very different protein targets. And we try to engineer a single antibody that binds all of these three targets. It's called multi-state design. So we start from those crystal structures, but while we design, we enforce that the sequence on the antibody on the light chain is pink and then the um, heavy chain is gray. We, we enforce that that sequence is, is the same. So this is sort of illustrated here in this movie. Why is this important? Well, this could be important because you can design one antibody to bind multiple targets. So if you think about HIV with many different strains with different surface protein sequences, if you want to design one antibody to bind them all to be broadly protective, such an algorithm would be very important. And um, interestingly, um, we found in this um, experiment that um, these uh, antibodies that we engineered that are part tend to have fewer mutations. They tend to be more similar to the original uh, germline antibodies. If we design the antibodies just against one target, they are more similar to mature antibodies. And so we can measure this. And um, there are two conclusions from this. First of all, Rosetta can mimic this maturation process. Rosetta can predict good mutations in an antibody that make move it to high affinity. And the second, uh, the second knowledge here is that these um, uh, original antibodies, we call them sometimes germline antibodies, the ones with the low affinity, they achieve this, this, this recognition of many different targets by being very flexible at their tips. And only once additional mutations are put in for the maturation, we stiffen those antibodies. And to achieve this kind of simulation, we you know, had to... Um, put in uh, some new algorithms into the Rosetta software to run these simulations in parallel fast, because you might want to have you know, 50 different viral proteins and design one antibody to bind them out, or so millions of atoms. So um, uh, this is not uh, quite uh, simple to do, but um, uh, uh, so this is where comes into the play, the Rosetta community, where we can develop these new algorithms uh, relatively quickly and then apply them. And so here's the result of this game. So we used um, uh, this antibody, which came out of a patient. Um, and we did not have any guarantee that this antibody is indeed the best possible protein neutralizing antibody of that type. But um, here we have a panel of viruses. And we can measure binding as well as neutralization. So let's stick with neutralization. The black box, that's PG9. That's the starting material that came out of the patient. The smaller the number, the less of the antibody you need to neutralize. Every queen, the numbers are tiny, so you don't need to read them. But every queen box sort of is a good neutralization uh, concentration for the antibody. And you see it hits maybe about 40% of this, of this sort of representative panel. Now. Once we redesign that and test the redesigned antibodies, we get a mixed result. This is very typical for Rosetta. Not every design works out because of our issues with the energy function and sampling and so on. So in this case, four antibodies were tested. This one is much, much worse. These two are maybe as good as PG9 itself, but this one is about twice as broad. It hits all, almost all of these strains tested. And it's about four times as potent. The concentration is about a factor four lower. And um, the um, a mutation this is a single point mutant. And the mutation produced um, is actually an, an asparagine to, to tyrosine mutation. 
And um, what we find is that it seems to do precisely that, stiffen, stiffen this loop in the conformation needed um, to bind. And so these kind of simulations help us to find the best possible antibodies um, that um, can be sort of the target for immunogens that we want to design in the next step. Um, now, before we design immunogens, the question is, um, do humans like you and me, can they make those antibodies readily, right? Do we have within these 10 to the 11 low affinity germline antibodies, do we have some that look like that with a few mutations, we can turn them into an antibody that will really neutralize HIV? So this was a study we did in, together with the, with the Quo lab. Um, uh, they did uh, next generation sequencing um, of um, uh, antibody repertoires in uh, blood donors for the, for the Red Cross, right? And so uh, these people are tested for HIV. They are HIV negative naturally. And so um, from that, we were able to determine 25 million antibody sequences. Um, and we then used Rosetta to screen through these 25 million and find the ones that are very long because we need, you remember this, this HCDR3 loop was really, really long in uh, uh, PG9 and this antibody we are interested in. Um, we found 25,000 antibodies that had that length, so 0.1%. And then we asked, would any of these 25,000 antibodies want to adopt this structure and have a high affinity to the HIV protein. We don't expect that any of those antibodies are gonna do that, right? Because these people have not been infected with HIV. They shouldn't have highly protective antibodies, but we can ask how far are they away? And this is shown in this plot on the left-hand side here. So these are the top 50 antibodies of those 25,000 I mentioned. Um, on the y-axis is Rosetta computed stability. Are these antibodies stable in this conformation? And on the x-axis is predicted affinity. How tightly do they bind? And PG9 is down here, as you see. And so if you look at this, you see that some of those antibodies approach PG9 in predicted affinity, but none of them is stable. This is a very interesting non-standard conformation of a loop. The anti the, the, these naive sequences, uh, the germline sequences are not stable in that conformation. And um, now what we can do though, is we can go ahead and we can um, uh, you know, design and we can ask how many mutations do I need to add to these guys to make them stable and high affinity. And if I do that, then you know, they wander down to the region where PG9 is. And if I start making those antibodies, you know, here's one particular example, the five mutations added by Rosetta, they actually start to bind and neutralize um, um, the virus, showing that these kind of antibodies exist in uh, humans. And this could be a um, um, vaccination strategy if I manage to build an immunogen that really just um, elicits uh, 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 this type of antibody convinces the immune system to make these kind of antibodies. You will hear about long loops when we talk about antibodies and vaccines. We just looked at one of those very long loops. Um, Rosetta has a number of algorithms to predict the conformation of loops. It's one of the difficult things to do. Um, here's again a particular example for HCDR3 um, uh, structure prediction that we uh, published a few years back, an algorithm that's really optimized for that particular application. And then here is another example for um, these kind of um, antibodies. Uh, this is uh, um, antibodies that neutralize the Ebola virus. And here we again see um, a um, uh, number of antibodies that bind in different ways. The antibodies are in colored, and then the surface protein of Ebola uh, is in, in gray, and you see it binds in, in, different, in different ways. These are, again, studies 
by our collaboration collaborators in the collab. Um, but then we can understand at atomic detail how these antibodies bind. And then go ahead and look in the human repertoire um, for new antibodies that neutralize um, the uh, Ebola virus or the Marburg virus in this particular case. These two viruses are connected. And so here we again went ahead and identified some of those exciting antibodies in humans that could be precursors to neutralizing antibodies for yet another viral, um, viral infection. Um, you could do the same for the SARS virus or for influenza. Um, these are the same computational technologies that can be applied. And here uh, is the structure of these antibodies that we uh, determined in this particular, in this particular paper. Um, Rosetta design is our topic. So before we go to immunogens and vaccines, uh, let me stick for uh, one more project with these long loops. Um, you have seen a few antibodies now where the CDR3 loop made almost all of the interactions, right? Um, so uh, couldn't we just create a peptide that has the same function of binding the viral protein and maybe um, um, protecting us? This could be easier than creating a, um, you know, neutralizing antibody in particular when it needs to be produced uh, for, for uh, usage in medicine. And so um, in Rosetta, you can do something, you can simulate protein folding. So we can cut out this long loop. This is now an antibody that targets influenza and you can run a folding simulation. You can take that peptide and ask it to fold. And uh, this is a plot you're gonna see this week more frequently. It's in score versus RMSD plot on the y-axis is the Rosetta energy, and the x-axis is how close this is to the conformation that was observed in the antibody. And what we see in the blue dots here, these are two different flavors of this peptide, um, you see that the energy is not particularly low. Um, and you also see that the ones that are closer, that are close to zero, the ones that are most similar to the conformation we see in the antibody, are not necessarily much better in energy than other ones that are further away. But now we can again run Rosetta design and we can ask which sequence would stabilize that conformation. But if we keep all the residues that are critical for this antibody to bind to the influenza surface protein hemagglutinin, and all of those we keep intact, we don't touch. But we allow all other residues to design. And you see there are nine mutations in this particular flavor. And you can, can turn this four blue into this red dot where you have much lower energies and you have a clear separation between the ones that are close to the conformation that we think is functional uh, from the ones that are further away. And then you can make those peptides and you can show uh, that they actually start. And here's a, again, a panel of, of influenza uh, uh, virus uh, hemoglutinin surface proteins. Uh, here are the two peptides I just showed you, the two flavors. Uh, here's the original antibody. And you do see that they bind and they bind the part of panel Again, uh, by simplifying the structure to this peptide, I can engage a part of panel of influenza viruses in this case with such a peptide, um, uh, peptide uh, tool. So um, the last few minutes, I wanna look into epitope-focused vaccine design. Uh, this is the original paper from 2014 out of uh, the Sheaf's lab um, and also Jim Crow's lab. Um, here they looked at um, um, RSV, respiratory uh, syncytial virus, and uh, we're really engineering a protein now that can be used as an immunogen. So the idea here is we have an antibody. This is here light chain gray. Salmon is the heavy chain. And we see how um, the viral protein binds. So there is this little peptide here. This is a portion of the viral surface protein. And now this is the epitope. This is really what a good antibody should bind. It should not bind anything else of the viral surface protein. So what you can do ahead is you take just that portion that interests you and forget everything else from the viral protein. And you design 
a protein that has this piece in yellow here built in. You can then do some tricks. You can add glycan to the blue regions so that the blue regions are better hidden. And then you can really get a focused response to that yellow region when you uh, inject this immunogen into, for example, in macaque. Um, it can um, uh, 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 create antibodies against this yellow region. Often these um, uh, proteins are also uh, put on multivalent particles to sort of uh, give more of the impression of a virus uh, where, where you display many different copies. This usually increases the immune response, okay? And so um, uh, we have also an example in our group uh, here is um, again going back to um, Ebola uh, virus um, versions. There is this membrane proximal region here, this alpha helix. We have a very exciting antibody from our collaborators uh, in the CoLab that binds to that region. And um, we went ahead and used Rosetta to find uh, small proteins that can display such an alpha helix with the amino acid sequence from this membrane proximal region, at least the residues that are needed to interact with um, the antibody. And you see that these designs very nicely bind, some of them very nicely bind to the antibody. Again, not all of them bind. That's typical. There's not a 100% success rate in engineering with Rosetta. We can determine the three-dimensional structure um, of these engineered proteins and compare them to the model. And as I said, um, a design only works if you have the structure at atomic detail correct. So we see here a superimposition of the Rosetta model and a structure determined by nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, uh, very similar. And then we can attach these immunogens to Rosetta engineered particles to larger proteins that self-assemble into um, you know, these spherical particles that have some uh, similarity to viruses. And that we can use as an immunogen to um, inject rabbits and um, they start to make antibodies that actually bind um, to, uh, they, uh, they start to make antibodies that recognize this particular epitope. And with that, I think I gave you a, sort of brief overview of some of the things that you're gonna learn about in, to, in these next days. Um, gonna learn also how to run those simulations and obviously much more background than I was able to cover. I thank you for your attention. I wanted to point out that most of the lectures this week are gonna be given by my postdocs and students. They put a lot of work into it. Um, and so I ask you to um, be respectful and um, um, uh, please engage them in, in constructive questions and let us know if there are things that we can improve. Um, here is a, a coronavirus conform picture of my research group and some of these faces you're going to see over the next um, uh, days. And with that, I thank you for your attention.